All right, so good morning. My name is Hillary Morgan Watt. Uh, I am with the Smithsonian Arts and Industries building. Oh, let me. Uh, I'm, I've been there for three days. It's a new, new position, but I've been with the Smithsonian for almost eight and working in museums for about 15. Um, so this is uh, the building on the National Mall uh, with many of the other Smithsonian museums. It's been closed for about two decades. Uh, this is just a sneak peek at some of the, the past exhibitions and projects. We're actually not open and we have big announcements coming um, next month. So I literally can't say anything else about it, but it's an exciting new project. Uh, and you'll hear, hear more if we stay in touch. So today is sort of an overview of uh, how museums are using social media. Um, I could spend, you know, a week talking just about Facebook, but it, we only have 45 minutes. So uh, please plan for your questions on anything that you'd like a deeper dive. Uh, but basically, what are we doing with these platforms? Um, social media, it's, it's social, it's a two way conversation. It's not a press release. It's not an academic paper. Uh, it's an interpretation tool. And uh, these are the main players that uh, North American museums spend most of their time on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. There are certainly many others. Um, you know, Tumblr used to be a very popular microblogging site. Uh, TikTok is sort of the new toy in town for sort of short videos. It's very popular with, you know, teens. Um, but a lot of museums are still kind of concerned about some of the privacy with that social platform. So it's still pretty new and not everyone is on it yet. Uh, What's interesting is that um, all of these platforms, how they've really sort of shifted and uh, they've sort of morphed um, into each other. So what used to be special about photos on Instagram, you know, they, they really all have a lot of features that do the same thing. So each supports uh, photo, video, live stream, um, and different lengths of narrative. Uh, and uh, sharing news articles and, uh, you know, direct links. So in an Instagram post, you might not have a link in your newsfeed post, but if you use the story feature, you can hyperlink um, directly to your website and sort of share the content that way. Um, basically, it's, uh, an, it's all an amazing opportunity. You can reach people all over the world. It just takes you know, a time commitment and sort of building a following and sharing engaging content that people want to share sort of beyond their own network. Uh, YouTube, um, most museums don't typically have a budget to use it effectively. It usually exists as an archive of uh, past public programs or past exhibition um, content. And that's, that's great. Uh, that's, that's where cool. most museums that I've worked in uh, have sustained, that it's just this incredible archive that you could scroll back and listen to uh, many artist talks. Okay. Just let me know, sorry about that. Okay, okay. Um, it's rare. Um, so basically just YouTube, it's much more intended to be like a weekly broadcast that you would have a hosted series um, with new content and people subscribe and they wanna keep coming back for something that's new. Um, most museums aren't quite there uh, in terms of a budget to sort of sustain that. So either, either approach, um, it's different. You'll still get views for, uh, academic programs, you know, when people are keyword searching, um, you know, your talk still might come up on like a Google search. So it's still, it's a great tool that could be expanded on um, if you sort of have either that skill set on staff for, you know, video editing and producing and um, just things like that. Uh, there's been so many changes in even the last eight months with these platforms, basically with uh, you know, the world in quarantine that the social platforms have sort of adapted to newer lifestyles. So even just within the last two weeks, there's changes to Facebook. What used to be, um, you know, two years ago, if you had a Facebook event, it would just exist as like a calendar reminder. 
And then it sort of adapted to, you could have a scheduled live stream that would be part of the calendar reminder. And so when people would log in, they'd get you know the notification that, oh, this live stream is starting in an hour. And uh, now uh, there's even more features. So basically you used to have to pick a date and a location, but no one's going anywhere in quarantine. So now you can, you know, simple things like clicking that the event is happening online makes a big difference. Or um, within the last two weeks, the latest thing is that they're going to roll out, you can list a an event, but now you can list it as a class, which is really common for museums. It's going to be, you know, a lesson for, um, you know, craft or a new technique. Uh, it's just great to sort of see those shifts. Uh, if you work in social, it's also kind of overwhelming to keep up with all of the changes. Uh, Twitter, within the last few months, adopted a feature that they're calling fleets. And that's basically like Instagram stories, which also basically adapted the format of Snapchat. So they all blend together. Um, it's a constantly sort of chaotic, uh, changing, exciting opportunity uh, to stay in touch with. Um, so what museums are, oops, uh, one back, okay. The, the, the greatest strength for museums to be on social is to sort of be that welcoming voice of the brand. Uh, think of it as, um, you know, the, the online text version of someone who works in visitor services, someone who greets visitors, makes them feel welcome and excited about, you know, what they're going to learn with you. So for the social presence, this is basically the key as to why someone's going to follow you online and why they're going to stay engaged. Um, a really great exercise, uh, if this is sort of a newer concept for your museum, is to think of if your brand was a person, um, you know, what would they sound like? You know, how old might they be? Um, you know, where do they live in town? You know, sort of all those attributes that you might think of a person that you really want on staff, you know, that those attributes can kind of be teased out a little bit um, into the voice online. So this is just a, a little screenshot of a, of a Twitter, um, encounter from the Smithsonian. And, you know, someone's talking about using uh, their sources and art scrolling, um, sort of, it's just sort of making a joke about, you know, how we scroll on the internet and you're constantly looking through your newsfeed. And this person was focusing just on art and Smithsonian kind of made a joke about it's better than doom scrolling, which is like a common term of when you just, you know, spend hours online and, and just read and read and read until you're kind of bummed out. Um, I'll have some examples on the other slide, but everything that we recommend that works really well is sort of, um, missing, you know, conversational, just like you, you would expect from, you know, someone giving a tour in a museum, someone who's there, who's passionate, who's, you know, excited to, you know, talk about this content with you. That That's what we really recommend for an online presence. Oops. Um, Okay, so the, here are two screenshots from some other museums um, that we follow and interact with. Um, on the one side, you can see that someone visited, you know, brought their family, shared a favorite artwork, and you know, the museum actually wish, wished them happy birthday. Um, on the other image, it's someone uh, repurposing a historic image that I think is from the um, the open digitized files from the Field Museum, and they made sort of a pun. We celebrate, we celebrate, uh, you just sort of used a bit of humor. Uh, humor isn't necessarily uh, required, um, but sort of that welcoming excitement, um, it really makes the difference of, you know, standing out amongst your peers and why someone would sort of continue to have that online relationship with you. Um, sometimes it's, it's text and it's phrases, sometimes it's using emojis. Um, and you can look at uh, just other museums to sort of see how they interact. And sometimes it changes uh, per platform. Sometimes people are maybe a little more serious on Twitter, but on Instagram, how a museum might interact, they'll use a lot more of the emojis, the little icons, with, with smiley faces and hearts. Um, it just sort of depends on the tone. The Oops. Okay, so how do we take all of our museum content and kind of break it down for social media? Basically, everything that you're already doing is an opportunity for storytelling. So for exhibitions, um, there's sort of that whole arc of 
something that's new, you know, so there's the buildup and, um, you know, the teasers of what the, the new thing that's coming that can be in, um, you know, photos or video if you have it, um, but sort of building up to the moment of the opening and then there's the opening and then there's how do you sustain it and basically um, repurposing your content, which we're going to come back to in a minute, but um, everything that's in there, you get to sort of slowly roll out on social media and how can you amplify. So if you have exhibition text um, and a narrative, you know, you're pulling out pieces of that um, to share online with your audiences and every specialist who worked on that exhibit is an opportunity to feature that staff member and sort of tell their unique story. So it can be, you know, the collections manager and how they worked with objects. It can be the librarian and how they worked with the curator preparing mm -hmm. research materials. Um, there's a lot of touch points. Um, new research uh, is obviously always great to announce. Um, collection highlights, you know, what's on view, what's not on view. Um, anything behind the scenes is always the best. Um, it's just special and people just go nuts. Audiences love to see, you know, collection storage. So this is an example with um, Esther from the uh, National, uh, Na National Museum of Natural History showing um, platypus specimens. And this was for a campaign actually about um, all things eggs uh, for Easter and at the Natural History Museum, you know, so plat platypus, platypi, uh, you know, they lay eggs. They're one of the few mammals that do. And the campaign was basically all the touch points of eggs. So there was the mammals that lay eggs, um, you know, birds, eggs, and how they're naturally camouflaged, you know, depending on the environment that they're in um, and, and on and on and on. Um, so just really interesting ways to sort of make larger connections um, across mm -hmm. content. Uh, uh, so collaborators and amplification, again, back to the sort of obvious point that social media is social. Um, whenever you can have other people on your side to help tell your story, to be your cheerleaders, to be your partners, um, that's really great. Uh, basically, you know, all boats rise together. So you might have other museums that you're working on a project with or another gallery. Uh, you might be um, have uh, fellows studying uh, from a local university or an international university. Uh, whenever you can sort of reach out to, you know, let them join, um, you know, something like a storytelling or launching of a new uh, paper or project. Um, it's really great to do that. Uh, you might be familiar with the term influencers. Uh, in, in sort of the profit world, uh, influencers are people who have really large followings uh, and you're paying them to uh, help promote your product. Museums typically don't have budgets for that. I mean, who has an extra $50,000 for someone to have one Instagram post? Uh, it's unlikely for any museum. So I like to think of them as uh, cultural ambassadors and um, that's just people who know your museum, know your collection, love you. They probably visit and talk about you online already and sort of reaching out to them uh, to sort of bring them into like more of an inner circle is just a really great way to help grow your following and help have other people basically say really nice things about you online. Um, and sort of that, since there's no money exchange, it's, it's much more about um, just relationship building. Uh, and a great way to do that is uh, having social meetups. Um, so this is a photo from the Natural History Museum when I used to work there. And uh, the mixture of the group, we had held an open call so people could sign up for an opportunity to visit the whale collection with our whale specialist. And so this is a mixture of people who use social media, of um, gallery representatives, uh, a couple journalists, um, some students, and uh, this was a um, this wasn't time to any new exhibit. This was just sort of an opportunity to meet people, um, get them excited about the brand, and you know show them something really cool, and sort of have those building blocks in place um, for future you know events and announcements. Okay, so the content calendar is basically how you map everything out. Uh, and if this isn't work that you already do, 
Um, it can sort of seem overwhelming, but once you sort of have a calendar in place and you kind of divide up the priorities, it becomes a lot easier because anything you're doing on social should really be supporting the larger communication goals of the whole museum, you know, in the strategic plan. So chances are you probably have, you know, three to five main targets for a year. And if you kind of break that down over the 12 month calendar, um, it becomes less scary. You know, so think of what you're going to talk about, you know, month to month and quarterly. Um, you know, maybe it's, uh, you're going to have, you know, two new papers that you're publishing and, and you have one new object joining the collection and, you know, two exhibits. When you sort of break that down over the year, you sort of know every two months what you're working towards. Um, and that's just kind of the main focus of your messaging and everything else should sort of support that. And then any other time is kind of like the filler of things like uh, holidays and seasons and, you know, local events. Uh, holidays and historic dates are a really easy hook um, because it's what people like. It's sort of comforting uh, to know, you know, on this day in history, such and such happened or people, it's, it's just a natural hook. Um, and often other museums and cultural entities are going to talk about it anyway. So you're already joining a topic that already exists. Um, so something really simple like, oh, sorry, I'm not going to take my chat. Um, this is a post from American Art uh, about the winter solstice. Um, oops, I just clicked through, sorry. Uh, so that's just a really common, you know, seasonal post. People love it. You know, they're in the mood for winter weather and you're sharing an image that sort of reflects what they're hoping to see anyway. Um, social media is obviously 24 seven machine, but your staff is probably not. Uh, most museums only have one person, often half of a person. Uh, usually people have other duties that they're fulfilling. Um, so it's, it's great that you can schedule some social media posts in, in advance and then start try to work out, you know, who's on point to, uh, you know, be aware of the news cycle and something that's happening, um, you know, in the current trends that maybe is an opportunity to connect to. Uh, I would always say quality over quantity. You know, if it's if it's part time, then that's how you do your social media. Your social presence will be part time, but it's going to be quantity. You know, post with purpose um, and don't make noise. You know, just like filler tweets or Instagram posts that weren't really, you know, thoughtfully written. You know, just as much as you didn't want to write it because you didn't have time, your audience won't want to see it. Um, So thinking about how to repurpose your content, uh, this is regardless of having a full-time staffer or part-time staffer. It's just a smart way to work. Um, so this is just a photo from an infinity mirror room of the artist um, Yayoi Kusama. And uh, we've, we did an exhibition when I was at the Hirshhorn Museum in 2017. Uh, but a way to think about it is, uh, one one short video clip, one 20 second video clip, you know, from a smartphone, not even not even any, you know, elaborate equipment, all the places it's going to live and continue to work for you. So basically it can be uh, content for the exhibition trailer. And then you can make a second trailer that has like a curator voiceover speaking with the artwork. Um, it's going to be in your press materials that you can send out to press and it'll be in their stories. Uh, it's going to be on social media and basically anytime you want to talk about that artwork, you know, there's the lead up to the exhibit, there's the opening of the exhibit, there's during the exhibit, you know, when you sprinkle that in with your other content, you're probably going to use it a couple times during that period. Um, it's going to be in education lesson plans, it's going to look really great on your website homepage as like a banner. Um, it's going to go out in fundraising emails, um, you know, the shiny beautiful artwork uh, as you're trying to ask for money. Um, at the end of the year, video content or just images from important programs are always going to, or an, an option is like a wrap up video. It's always really great as sort of a thank you for the, you know, the year with us. Um, it's going to go in the collection record. It's going to go in your archive. You can send it to your partners. Um, so just really think of that for how you document any of your important projects that you're going to use it another 50 times. Um, Another way to sort of think about 
um, your content is that any social media post about an object, it's not um, the entire history of it. Uh, it's um, just one snapshot that you're trying to sort of share that day. So one of your objects, you know, you can talk about it 20 different ways. You can talk about, you know, um, what you're visually seeing and sort of the materials. Um, you can talk about the, the biography, the history of it, um, the cultural connections, you know, where this fits in history. So this is um, a contemporary sculpture by uh, Janine Antoni. It's a self-portrait. And one bust is made of chocolate, one bust is made of soap. And she, so the title is Lick and Lather. So she licked the chocolate and she bathed with the soap. Um, you know, so this is contemporary art. This is pretty funky, it's out there. There's a lot of different things you could say, but um, for any of your collections, uh, sometimes it's even just a great staff activity, you know, invite people for a brainstorm activity and have, you know, an agenda of five objects and everyone needs to sit there and come up with five stories that they would tell about it. And that's another really great way to sort of, you know, build out your social content. Uh, I was going to go over just a few campaign uh, examples today. So this is, uh, these are some photos from um, an Instameet. So it's an Instagram social meetup. And this was uh, organized to sort of meet with local community members, people who really love the social app Instagram. And so we had about a group of um, 20 photographers come for a special um, morning tour with a curator. Uh, it was before the museum was open. And this is just a really common format. Um, the incentive is that it's sort of this exclusive access with a curator. They'll get to take sort of beautiful photos when the museum isn't busy. And it's just really about um, developing relationships with, again, sort of the idea of um, cultural ambassadors uh, for you. And this, this particular tour was about the theme of light in contemporary art. So you can see there's a, the blue image is like a Dan Flavin sculpture. And uh, they got to meet the curator, they got to meet each other, they took lots of beautiful photos. And that was um, just a really easy, basically no cost way to sort of, um, you know, get to, get to know people in your community directly and build up people who love you and will share photos on Instagram. Um, This was um, just a few thoughts on a, uh, a new exhibition that we had. So the artist uh, Pat Steer um, made this exhibition Color Wheel. It's a site-specific painting sculpture at the Hirshhorn Museum. And uh, in terms of social promotion, what we did, we had the opportunity to film the artist uh, in her studio which is pretty rare, that's, that's not necessarily the norm, but she's making this artwork for the museum. So to document that was really important. Um, so it was sort of planned for in the annual budget as sort of the year ahead as like a top priority that this, this is what some money needs to go towards for a videographer. So we filmed the artist, uh, some interview questions, we filmed her painting. And again, that repurposing content that was on the website, it's on our YouTube channel. Um, it's used in, you know, flashy video for like the gala and for fundraising. And then in the other image, um, this is a photo from a morning preview. It was again, sort of that first look preview with uh, Instagram photographers. And you can see they actually sort of dressed uh, to the color, um, which was sort of an extra layer of fun and made for really great photos. And sort of that type of event, that first look is then shared on their platforms and with their entire audiences. And some of these people have, you know, 50,000 followers, 90,000 followers. So then everyone who follows them has seen these beautiful images of this really exciting art exhibit and then wants to come to the Hirshhorn to see it. Um, so that's just always a very recommended um, uh, strategy. Okay, I wanted to touch a little bit on um, pandemic because uh, basically many of us have been in quarantine Our museums have been closed for what's coming up on a year and sort of how museums have been dealing with that. Uh, for anyone who works in social at these museums, your day-to-day -day hasn't necessarily shift, shifted that much because you post online anyway and now you're just doing more of it. But um, the tone and the content has certainly shifted. Uh, I've changed, or sorry, I've, I've chosen these uh, screenshots for a few particular hashtags. 
So the sunflower, you'll see um, it's an artwork by Georgia O'Keeffe, but you'll see the hashtag is museum from home. Um, that was sort of a new uh, uh, international museum tag of basically we're all at home and we're trying to, museums are trying to share content that's sort of calming, um, uplifting, joyful, and sort of recognizing that we're stuck at home in apartments and houses with family and everything's loud and noisy. And what can we share that will sort of address that and attempt to offer some of the peace that a visitor might get um, in, in the space. Um, Liz, I can't see my chat. So if I'm going over, please let me know. <laughs> we'll do, you're, you're in good shape, thank you. Okay. okay. Um, then uh, the hashtag museum moment of Zen uh, is another great tag and these are still active. So any work that you're doing, you could, you could see this online and you could join that conversation. Um, you know, we're hoping that audiences will sort of click that tag and then see more. Um, so museum moment of Zen was much more about something that will um, offer again, sort of more calming, uh, peaceful, you know, meditative. And I like what this example from the Columbus Museum of Art did, that they not only shared an artwork that is calming and peaceful, but they actually sort of made a suggestion of um, a breathing exercise that you could do with it. Uh, then the third example is um, a larger initiative that I worked on with the New York Historical Society. And it was this campaign that really went viral on Twitter uh, it, the concept was simple of, you know, you share bouquets of flowers, you know, for people, um, you know, friends and family to either celebrate or commemorate or to offer sympathy. And what could the online version of that be? And uh, we decided that museums could basically share flowers in their collection as a bouquet. And so it started with museums sending flowers to each other. So this is a, a screenshot of a Tiffany lamp at the New York Historical Society. And um, it was really open to everyone. And it started with people sharing, you know, artworks of flowers, and then, you know, scientific museums uh, sending images of specimens, you know, botany specimens, flower specimens, uh, and then everyone got involved. So, you know, textile museums were sharing, uh, you know, if there was a design on, um, you know, a scarf or a blanket that had a flower, and it grew and it grew and audiences started you know, using museum collection items to send them to each other and then just kept growing. And basically what was started as like a one day Twitter campaign became sort of a, a three week viral campaign um, from with entries all over the world, th thousands and thousands of entries. It reached like 67 million people. Um, just, it was a simple concept and it was just, uh, something beautiful and calming when all of the things online were just depressing news stories of how awful the virus was and continues to be. It was a campaign intended to have a moment of calm and something that was joyful in people's um, social feeds. Uh, okay, I'm not gonna dwell too much on this because uh, Matthew is doing a whole session on measuring success. But I just wanted to speak about the tools briefly that, um, again, museum budgets, we're the Smithsonian, but we don't have necessarily a lot of money for, you know, something like a metric software. So we're really in the same boat as like a historic house museum or a small gallery. And we really just pull um, the numbers from the individual platforms themselves. So you can go into Facebook or Instagram or Twitter and they have insights and metrics and numbers. Um, how much, how many people your content is reaching and sort of how people are engaging. Uh, so there's, there's lots of data to pull from that with no cost. Uh, if you do have something larger, that's, um, you know, maybe there's one shiny new blockbuster exhibition that you're working on, or if you're opening a new building, you might want something that you could measure a hashtag with. And I've used Keyhole, and I really recommend that. It's one of the few tools that gathers everything in a really nice place and sort of gives you, gives you the number of um, how many people participated like using your hashtag, uh, where they are in the world and sort of how uh, many people you reached. Um, it's sort of a one-stop shop. Uh, and I would also just add that any of your numbers, they really don't tell a story. It's always about um, the context surrounding it. You know, if I wanted big numbers, uh, all I would ever share is blue artwork because that's, you know, statistically the, the content that people love the most and gravitate towards. 
um, you know, our, our national zoo, they would just share baby panda photos all the time because that would win the internet and get big numbers. So just keep it in mind of not everything you share is the most popular, but you know, it's surely educational and important and it's just gonna have sort of the wave of those numbers. Um, not all of our artwork is immersive experiences. Sometimes it's small sculpture shows that people have never heard of. Um, so just all within context of what success is for that project. Okay, I also just wanted to touch on uh, crisis uh, preparation because social media is a communications tool and I think whenever you can um, to think of the worst in advance and you can avoid it. Um, so just sort of some, some quick thoughts on preparing for crisis communications. It'd be great to do uh, a vulnerability audit, which basically it just means, you know, what are your pain points? Where are your risks? Um, and again, sort of if you don't have, you know, budgets for things like this, you know, who does? Simple things like setting up Google alerts um, is great because you're going to be notified whenever your, you know, your museum is in the news. And I would set up Google alerts for the proper spelling of your name and then a common misspelling version of your name because that happens too if you've ever worked with like their press team. Uh, it's, it's really common for someone to misspell your name even when they're talking about you. Uh, and maybe any of your senior staff uh, on your team. So people who are kind of spokespeople for your museum, like the director and like a senior curator. Um, it'd be great to know who's on the crisis team um, in your museum, sort of who's on the phone tree for, you know, final comments of, you know, if you make a statement or if you have to announce um, the museum is going to be closed, you know, for, you know, bad weather and the, the power's out. Um, even something that's like simple and uh, you know, no one's injured if, you know, the power's out, you can't open the doors that day, but knowing who, um, who has to sign off on that decision is really important because with social media versus a journalist calling, you know, social media, you're going to have people asking you, you know, why is it closed? Why can't I visit? It's just, there's no, there's typically no room for, um, delayed action, um, Another thing to think about if you haven't already is sort of who on your staff is media trained. Um, and that's just to support all things. That's to support social, that's to support press um, because they're probably gonna be involved in writing those final decisions of you know, what you're saying online um, about whatever situation you're dealing with. And again, just basically, especially if we're in quarantine and you have some extra time on your hands, drafting any of your statements so you have sort of a uh, a touch point to start with, just you're saving yourself some time. And for any crisis situation, um, think about metrics. Again, like it's important to know how you reach your audience anyway, but if you, if you do that regularly, <clears throat> it's gonna help you measure if you're going through, you know, some type of controversial situation, how people are talking to you and about you, you're gonna see how different it is from like a regular day. And that's just sort of better information to have. Um, and this is just a, a sample checklist if it's helpful. Um, sometimes if you're working in social, people might say negative things and you know, a senior curator might you know, see it and think, oh my gosh, we have to release a statement. You know, they totally misunderstood what's going on. And sort of the checklist is to help you put it in perspective that People say negative things on the internet every day, but it's how bad is it and is it persisting and is it continuing and is it actually a crisis or is it just one bad day and people didn't like your exhibit for whatever reason. Um, so this is something for your for your archives to just keep in mind, keep it in perspective. Um, I also just wanted to share the wealth of knowledge uh, museum practitioners are always very passionate and love to talk about their craft and people who work in museum social are the same. Uh, if you use Twitter, this is a hashtag that you can follow, uh, hashtag Muse social, and people share articles, people share advice, they ask questions um, sort of specific to this subject. And uh, these are a few key people who work in uh, museum and social uh, that I would just, if you, if you want to learn more, these are a great starting point because again, they'll share examples of their work, they'll share news articles. And then the last person on this list is um, actually Taylor. She's a journalist with the New York Times 
and she writes about social media. Um, so basically any cutting edge, new update, feature, trend, um, they're gonna be writing about it. So if you, if you missed the boat and you check their Twitter feed, you're gonna see what the latest is. And that's, that's what I do. Hillary Morgan, I'm just gonna give the one minute warning because we wanna make sure we have to up oh, even okay. better. <laughs> so I apologize that was, it's very condensed, um, but I'm happy to answer questions or give, I could talk about more uh, campaign samples if that would be helpful.